Ladies and gentlemen, angry Americans around the country, around the globe, welcome to a conversation with a guest that I have been looking forward to talking to ever since I had the first idea of this show. A man I admire, a man I follow, a man I revere, a man that has probably had as much of an impact on my life as any other human being. Uh, my mentor, my friend, the great Oracle, as many of us know him, the great and powerful Wayne Smith is with us for this episode. Hello, my friend. How are you? You talking to me? <laughs> How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. I'm good. So first off, thank you. I'm so humbled and grateful. Um, but I, I want to start with the question I ask of all of our guests, especially during the pandemic. Wayne, where are you? And what's it been like for you and the people who are close to you? Well, really, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I love spending time with you and talking with you. And this, this is very big. Um, this is a very special moment in time and in history. But I'm speaking with you from Warwick, Rhode Island, which overlooks the Narragansett Bay. It is really such a beautiful part of the state, um, kind of up high, so I'm able to look and can see miles, can see down to Newport from Warwick. So it's really a very, I'm so very blessed. My wife, daughter, and I are so very blessed to be here in this location and frankly, to be alive at this point in time. And you're in maybe the coolest room that I've had any guest in so far. I mean, there's the Room Raider Twitter account's been playing with me about my car and giving me shitty ratings. But if Room Raider rated your room, for folks who can't see the video, and I urge them to go back and check it out, you're in, you're in this beautiful wood, zen tree in the background. You look like the, the, the king of, of the forest, like the, the zen <laughs> king of the forest. So can, can you tell me... Tell folks about like the, the physical space you're in for folks, especially who are listening and can't see it. Certainly, this is, uh, we call it the wood room, um, but I have one of my favorite oil paintings. It's of, talk about an angry, but it's a Native American warrior um, on the wall. And part of the room is brick and the other is wood paneled and, it looks out into a tree line. So it's really such a absolutely ideal spot for meditating. Our daughter works out in here at times when we let her, uh, <laughs> but it's also the room that you and Lauren and the guys will hopefully stay in when you come to visit. So it really is a lovely space of quiet, but um, real kind of peace and bliss it's it's laid out very nicely i love it i can't i can't wait i can't wait to come and having a conversation with you is fun but at the same time challenging because we talk all the time you know we talk on the phone we've spent so much time together in person you know you really are our family to us but um and i've been talking to you throughout the pandemic and we've been facetiming and you've been seeing the kids and we've been talking tomorrow but but can you can you break down what you've been thinking and experiencing and feeling in this period of isolation? You're such a great um, compass for so many of us that know you, but what, what are your thoughts on, you know, what it's like in Warwick, Rhode Island and what this last couple months have been like for you there? Well, thank you again. I mean, you're so gracious and, and complimentary. I, I don't deserve it, but um, for me, it's, it's, this has been a bit of a flip. I must admit, um, and I mean that because this is life in wartime. And as an old combat medic, at times I find still, sadly, that it's difficult to live in peacetime. Mm. Um, and by that I mean so many Americans, so many people around the world are caught up in their own bubble and the politics or society or life, you know, we have been on cruise control. 
This pandemic, the utter failure of our country, state, to be able to respond to this pandemic in a coherent, meaningful way has in a very strange sort of way, Paul, made me feel like I'm almost back in Vietnam. Mm. And by that, I mean, I feel very much like I'm in a war zone. I've, uh, it's not that I look at Americans as enemy, but I see a lot of Americans as threats. I think Americans have been driven by fear for the longest time. And until the pandemic, you know, we have been, it's been pretend. Mm. This pandemic has exposed the fault lines of race, of, again, the failure of our society to function. We have seen how fragile life is. We've seen runs on food supplies. And so the American people have gotten a real fast awakening as to what life is like on the verge, or as I said earlier, in wartime. So, I mean, for me, I, again, I, I don't say this with great comfort, but my experience in Vietnam, my experience in war has lent itself to me where I feel very fucking comfortable. I'm ready. I saddle up when I go out to stores. I was wearing masks very early and when people would look at me strange and I didn't give a shit, I kind of liked it um, because I saw the pandemic coming. Mm. I saw the potential threat to myself, to my family. So in a very strange sort of way, and I have spoken to a number of veteran friends, you among them, and I remember calling saying, you know, how do you feel, you know, and do you, do you feel somewhat similar? You, have you adjusted to, um, I mean, it's again, wartime, back to that analogy, we hear daily body counts, mm -hmm. we get casualty reports, um, there's talk about supplies, and it is a very eerie, and again, not a perfect fit at all for the kind of wars that we have experienced, but Americans have felt under the threat of their very lives mm -hmm. and their families. And it has put us as a nation on a kind of war footing. But me as a person, it has accentuated my warrior spirit. So I feel very powerful, frankly, and also vulnerable because I know having been exposed to Agent Orange, having health issues, that I, I'm at some higher risk than a lot of people. So I guard my health vigilantly, and yet I feel engaged. I feel mm -hmm. as though I still am making a difference. Um, I have had some of the most honest conversations with my uh, with 27 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. um, we have stopped talking about the kind of bullshit like, you know, how the Patriots are doing or the Giants or whatever, and focus more on family, mm -hmm. on health, on where this country's going. What's the truth? I mean, these enormous issues that so many Americans take for granted, but we as veterans, um, I think, can slip into that other mindset of having to live life more on the edge, if that makes sense. It all makes sense. Everything you say makes sense. That's why we call you the Oracle. I mean, you break it down and then you got that nickname at some point during Storm the Hill many years ago because you had this power to help people understand the situation, to understand the history, to understand their own trauma. Um, you know, you've been able to see clearly through so many periods of time. And it, it did feel that way to me at times. We've talked about it. Like I felt leaving the house in Manhattan was like leaving the wire. Right. And, and you feel threats around you. You're trying to keep your people close to you. I taught my son, I, I think during the pandemic, I said, stand next to me and behind me. 
Yes. You know, like if there's a threat, stand yeah. behind me. Right? Yeah. And training him to do that yes. in a really formal way. You know, it, it came in handy a couple of days ago when we saw we were in the woods and saw a snake. <laughs> and I said, remember, yes. stand, but the training did kick in. And there was a degree uh, of power in it, feeling that we can handle this. We've been through this. Um, that's challenging for those around us, maybe who haven't been through those same situations. And I remember having a conversation with Lauren saying, you know, we're in this together, but I think there are some times you're going to need to let me lead because I've been through this before. And there are times when you're going to be through things that you need to lead, but you, you are leading us through all of this. Um, you are also not, not only one of the most insightful and, and, and wise people that I know, you're also one of the coolest. We talk a lot about music. We talk a lot about culture. We talk a lot about art. Um, and, and as a part of this show, uh, I, I want to know, I want people to know what we've been, we've had drinks many a times. What is your drink of choice, Wayne Smith? If you had one drink, what would you choose? Um, I, having just one is a little challenging, <laughs> but my go-to drink is a fairly nice Cabernet. Um, really, um, that's kind of always reliable, mm. but you know, I can also wear a, a nice uh, single malt scotch very easily. <laughs> and I tend not to discriminate against some of the uh, VS or VSOP cognacs. So, I, I mean, I, um, I, but I don't drink a lot, interestingly yeah. enough. I find that um, marijuana, um, just a toke of hit or two, that has a much more natural, calming, lovely effect. And um, yeah, so, but my, my drink, I could say, I, I could, uh, maybe there's a little bit of Frenchman in me somewhere way back. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you are a Renaissance man. And yeah, you're I, don't, man of, I don't think so. <laughs> you're a man of history, but you're also a man of the future. And um, I'm with you. You know, I, I, many times my drink of choice is marijuana, especially as I've gotten older. Because yes. I feel like it's not as hard on my body. I feel yes. like it is more medicinal, if you will, right? Yes. Um, and you and I have talked about this. So I can't let, there's so many things that I want just your perspective on. Um, and I'm going to come to the first car question because that I know will be great. But staying on the issue of cannabis and marijuana, you and I have been advocates together for marijuana reform, for cannabis reform, for veterans and for the general population. I mean, you know, you, you grew up in the 60s, you served in Vietnam, you were part of the anti-war movement. Now you've, you've seen this come full circle. Can you break down your thoughts on marijuana and cannabis right now? I mean, did you think you'd see a day like this? Uh, and just what, what are your thoughts on, on how far that and drug policy has come or hasn't come? You know, I'm pleased to, to share with you, even before I became a veteran and went to war in Vietnam, I was a hippie. You know, I, I, I flew a freak flag, you know. Um, literally, the night before I was inducted into the Army, I saw cream. And this isn't like one of those. Also, I somewhere still have the ticket stub. November 14th, 1968. Rhode Island Auditorium, Cream was their final tour. Um, with, so Clapton. with Clapton. Eric Clapton, Ginger Baker, and wow. one of the greatest singers, Jack Bruce. Um, and, but, you know, all, well, music has been a, such a soundtrack in my entire life, and it still is. And I'm so very fortunate to have music in my life. But to answer your question, um, I was <laughs> growing up in Rhode Island, very integrated, you know, Asian, black, white, um, trans, really very, very um, fortunate, you know, but also was very natural growing up in Rhode Island. But most of my friends, and also, I should say, I was able to travel in different circles. Like, I had some friends that were really hippies, and I had some other friends that 
um, from a pot of providence that were less economically um, uh, resourced, and they would tend to drink beers and you know go to the beach on the weekends. So I was one of the first guys to um, I was turned on to smoking hashish. Um, and <laughs> And one of, I uh, played soccer and other sports, but one of my best friends is a brother named Mark Olson, Swedish brother. Mark and I, we were like Quinn and McGuire from the Mamas and Papas song, still getting higher in LA, you know? <laughs> I, really, we, we thought we were lovers and, um, <laughs> and we, we were pretty cool. But marijuana, well, actually, it was hashish was what yeah. I was introduced yeah. to first. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, there's something very special about toking on a little bit of hashish and playing soccer. Yeah. And, yeah, we did. And, um, and it was very cool. So, so my, some of my friends that were smoking marijuana and were hippies. And it wasn't just smoking marijuana and hanging out, but it was the mindset. It was, you know, more peace and love than the imagination of how we could make the world better, more peaceful, that we didn't need the kind of polarization on race or on class that was so prevalent in this country. And I remember the uh, this was around the time, maybe even before Timothy Leary, but the, the, some of the taglines were tune in, turn on, drop out. You know, don't be part of this, this kind of established system. Don't just be another number. So it was lovely to um, be part of this band of gypsies. Mm. Again, young guys and girls and uh, we would follow, listen to very cool music. I mean, I, I saw Janis Joplin, I saw C Crosby, Stills and Nash, and this was more in the 70s, but um, yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate to be able to be introduced to marijuana at a time when we thought we could change the world. We could turn on the world to be more in line with the subculture of marijuana, make love, not war, um, to break down the barriers of racial isolation and class distinction. It's a very, very wealthy um, uh, friends um, from high school and and um, where I hung out on, over near Brown University, um, um, who were Jewish and just different cultures. So it was lovely to be part of that. It was even we had, um, they call it free love, I guess now, but it was, it was very cool to um, find a woman, girl, attractive, and um, and you know, get a little high and drive down to the ocean and watch the sunrise, and thought that was like better than seeing a show. And so it was. It was really. I had some wonderful friends from different backgrounds, and um, we bonded. We were lovely. We were golden. And I'm pleased to say that I still carry a little of that child heart mm. with me even now. Mm. I still tend to be more the optimist that we can make the world a bit better. And also, and perhaps lastly, something about marijuana different than the stimulation of alcohol or other drugs for that matter. Um, and just a quick word about that. We now have, through archaeology, we have found that 3,000 years ago, people in Israel, Egypt, were using marijuana. Right. Um, just archaeological discoveries, we have found that 
there were some of the ancients, they brewed wine and beer. And so human beings have always sought to alter their consciousness, to change how we feel or how they felt. And, you know, we as Americans tend to be a little more conservative, a little tight ass. And, but as you know, through your readings, it's not uncommon where some cultures, certainly native people, they do vision quests where they will take peyote or other mm -hmm. kinds of stimulants to expand their mind, expand how they think and feel, and in some ways even to connect with God and the cosmos. So I must admit, I had that, well, I, that experience um, will always be a real central part of me, not unlike the experience in war, which is the flip side, mm. but to um, see what human beings can do on a destructive side, in mm. addition to what we can do on a more creative, imaginative, and loving side of ourselves. Mm. I want to I want to go deeper on that in in a, in a minute. Um, but as we go on this journey with you through history and present and hopefully your thoughts on the future in this moment, because I think there's so many parallels, I, th I think, but I'm anxious to hear your thoughts between, you know, 1969, the summer of 69, this summer we're experiencing now, last summer, maybe they're kind of blending, but this, you know, this series of infernos that are happening simultaneously and overlapping and the cultural change and the moment and all of it, right? But, yes. but, but as before we get to that part of the journey, I can't let you off of this one because when you were growing up in, in Rhode Island um, and you were hanging out with your Swedish friend and do, going to cream shows, Wayne Smith, what the hell was your first car? <laughs> My first car was a Volkswagen. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of stumbled into it, um, but it was, it was a Volkswagen hatchback. And I will remember it especially because I had a shot at an MGB and I passed on it thinking, well, the Volkswagen might be a little more reliable. Big mistake, <laughs> big mistake. It was more reliable perhaps, but the cool factor of an MGB, um, so, but it also taught me, it was one of those lessons, even in the choices we make as young people, is not to simply be so cautious mm. in life, but to follow my instinct and trust myself. And I don't think I would have done as well trusting myself if I hadn't made the major faux pas of, of buying a Volkswagen Hatchback is my what, first what, Wayne, what year was the Volkswagen, if you can remember? What color oh was it? It had to be 1969 or 70. It was, yeah, it was, um, it was kind of, it was pretty. I mean, it was a nice little car, but, you know, it didn't have much character. Hmm. You know, it was, um, but yeah, it was, it, it had, uh, manual, which I've always loved. I've always loved driving, so the experience of driving and something about driving a manual speed car again tends to parallel life. The shifting, going through gears, downloading, downshifting, accelerating. Um, yeah, I, I, even, I see that you even got a lesson in the car. I knew you were going to have a lesson in every answer. Did you tell me what color it was? It was blue. But what color blue? What like describe it the blue? More like a sky powder blue, sky one of those just you know, just oh. really and, and again, that's what kind of sucked me in, you know, it's a good looking car. <laughs> and, oh, I love you it. Know, um so we go from we, we go from your from your journey in Providence and a cream show the night before <laughs> the night before you went in the army the night before i went into the military 
I absolutely saw cream. I, you, yes. go, you go to Vietnam as, as a combat medic. You, you know, recently were featured in the Ken Burns documentary. You've spoken for decades about your experience in Vietnam. Um, and then, you know, you come home, you go through a series of experiences. I, I can't summarize it all in, in one podcast, but um, you know, as we approach this moment, and I want to go deeper on on George Floyd and, and what's happening in the country with the protests. But, um, but, but that talk about when you came home and, and what you came home to and what you experienced with the backdrop of the conversations we're having now around race in America. And as a black man drafted into Vietnam, serving in Vietnam, coming home after Vietnam, and as you know, a renowned leader in the protest movement, You've been, uh, you know, in protests. You've been on all sides of what's happening right now. So I, I just want to give you a chance to talk about, you know, that time and portion of your life in whatever way you think is most important. Well, thank you again. And um, but just one slight change. Um, I joined the army. I did not get drafted. Right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to be a medic. I wanted to save lives. I thought I could do that, and um, and the it was would have been inevitable that I would have been drafted, and I didn't simply want to uh, be a grunt and just to um, be a combatant that kills people, but I wanted to try to save lives. Um, but. Going to Vietnam, even more than the military, it was a bit of a revelation, Paul, because for the first time I met people outside of, not just outside of Rhode Island, but I met people in the military, um, some white brothers, they never ever had met or known or dealt with African Americans or Hispanics or Asians for that matter. I met African-American brothers that didn't even know African-Americans lived in Rhode Island. <laughs> I mean, the, the level of awareness that so many young men had at the time, I was stunned. Not that they were ignorant or bad, but just so much that they didn't know or lacking experience. Mm. Um, so, and Going to Vietnam, just a word about that, because being in war, as you know, is such a totally insane, but normalized experience that has been written about in time and memoriam from the ancient Spartans and Greeks and other warriors but what one learns in war is so invaluable you wish people could learn without having to go through war to learn to to experience it and specifically what kind of man am i mm -hmm. i was particularly afraid of freezing i was afraid that my fear would prevent me from going to get wounded men my brothers, and I quickly overcame that. And, and it was um, not only a kind of a sense of awareness of me, um, but I got a nickname there too, I was nicknamed Captain Trip, um, in part because of some things I did in Vietnam, but more to the point, what I learned, Paul, especially between black and white, Hispanic, and even we had some Asian medics. Um, Kenny Bagadwan is a brother that lives in Oceanside, California, one of the bravest medics I've ever met. Um, Chuck Burns, a redheaded, freckled brother from Bend, Oregon, beautiful brother. One of the bravest medics I also met. I learned a lot from Chuck. But Again, we band of brothers, for lack of a better term, was in the shit in Vietnam, and we 
figured out a way where we could have each other's back. We could cover each other. The kind of brotherhood that you and I have, Paul, if, you know, you needed anything, you know, I'm there for you because of who you are and what we've cultivated as a relationship. That happened in war. That happened in Vietnam. But the one thing I do want to spend a little bit of time on is the black experience in Vietnam. For your, most of your audience are very sophisticated and informed, but, and they know that Vietnam was really America's first fully integrated war, military. There was some experimenting in Korea, but Vietnam was the showcase where Americans, black, white, Native American, Hispanic, and Asian Americans served, fought, and died, and bled together. And it was so very powerful. But what we saw was our humanity. Some of the Marines, they saw green, but we saw <laughs> the humanity of, right. of each of us. And that was, that cut through the bullshit. And it cut through all that crap that was back home. So in combat, I was measured by Doc, if I get hit, you're going to come get me. And that was the standard. And when some of my men got hit, the other machine gunners or others would go up with me or give me a field of fire so I could retrieve the wounded. Paul, there is nothing in this life that will ever match my regard for the courage and character of, again, somebody's white men that hadn't ever known or dealt with an African-American before Vietnam, and yet they put their life on the line for me and others, and I them. And that's how we became brothers. Mm -hmm. So, and, and for African-Americans, it was enormously revealing because in Nam, there was black consciousness. And that is, we saw it was a unfair war. We saw that African Americans were drafted in disproportionate numbers. We saw that blacks, poor whites, poor Hispanics and Native Americans were disproportionately in combat. We saw the inequity, but we again resolved that we're in it together. We have to depend on one another to survive. And the stories of courage, the examples of generosity of these men that I served with really has still sustains me in my life today. Mm. So I'm sorry for getting so bound into that, but for African Americans in Vietnam, we had an awareness of, we learned, we would talk like you and I do. We would talk about history, how there were black soldiers who fought with George Washington, Saratoga, and um, um, so many other Civil War battles, the Battle of Red Hook in New Jersey. Mm. And there, the awareness of how not only black and white soldiers fought in the Revolutionary War for freedom and independence, but sadly how shamefully they were treated after the war. But more than that, their courage is what was the tell. Their courage was what guided me. Mm. And they, like other soldiers after the war, they went back to their homes and tried, or families if they could find them, if they weren't sold into slavery, and rebuilt their lives. So for me, coming back from Vietnam, it wasn't just coming back from war, but coming back from a group of men I had never been closer to in my life, or ever would in some ways again. Like for people to put their lives on the line, what is that great quote? No greater love mm. than yep. one who puts down their life or risks their life for their fellow man or woman. So coming back, from Vietnam, we had all these promises we made to one another. How we, when we got back to the world, that's what we called the United States. It was the world. Vietnam was hell. But when we got back to where we're going to change the country, going to make a difference. We're going to 
uh, change politics. We were going to clean up the poor communities. We were going to fight for justice. We were going to have no more Vietnams. We we're never going to let another generation go to war like we went to. And we we're so very hopeful and so very naive. But there was also a degree of pride mm. that we as African Americans who served this country and for people like me who killed for this country, I was not ever going to take a back seat to anyone. I was not, it wasn't an attitude. I just, it wasn't even so much that I felt like an American, but I felt like I had given something to this country, a part of my soul. I, like you, were raised, thou shalt not kill. Mm. And part of being a medic was that I wouldn't, but I was involved in killing. And, and it troubles me to this day. But making peace with it and learning from that pain, and it is painful, it is very painful for me, even as I think about it now. Um, the young men, the young Vietnamese, who, you know, is their country, their land, they were fighting us as invaders. And the young Americans who thought we were doing our duty and just trying to kill the enemy and how mistaken we were. So coming from war and trying to readjust to the United States, still in the midst of racial strife. The country was divided over the Vietnam War. It was enormously difficult. Mm. And I will never forget, I landed in um, Oakland, California, and we were going over one of the bridges. I guess it might have been Golden Gate. No, it might have been the Oakland Bridge. And, you know, I remember thinking these fucking Americans. I mean, we're going to the beach. It was like there was no war happening whatsoever. It was such a separate reality mm. where hours ago, hours, I had left the men that I had served with that were fighting for this country and dying for this country. And here I'm back in the States, beautiful girls, <laughs> golden guys. And I mean, it was insane. Mm. And I must tell you, I thought it was more insane to be back in the States than in war. Because in war, I knew you live or you die, you do your duty, you protect your friends, the boundaries are fairly clear. Back in the States, there was so much, and remain, so much bullshit. We get lost in a petty little world. And, um, and in an ironic sort of way, I remember not ever wanting to lose that edge. Mm. And didn't ever want to forget how quick and easy it is to move from one zone to another, to move from a war zone mm. to a place of peace, so-called peace. Mm. But you and I know, and my brothers and sister Vietnam veterans knew, just a 16 hour flight back to Vietnam and you're back in the war zone. Mm. It was such a, a, a shift in reality and awareness. So if, I hope that makes sense. It does, it does. And I'm, I'm, I think it's an important journey for you to take us on, right? Because we're living through this moment and to hear you reflecting on a moment that in many ways was similar, in many ways is different. But you came back and you're thrust into this divided country, this increasingly violent you know, con country filled with protest and unrest. But you, you also have a, a deep understanding. You, know, you, you later became a human rights advocate. You advocated for people in Vietnam. You advocated for drug reform, for prison reform, for policy reform. Can you talk about your experience coming home and, and in particular, you know, your, your experience 
in learning about forgiveness. We were talking about it before this, and I asked you, you know, how do you want to tell that part of your story? But I think there's an important, in this moment, as we talk about the police and prisons and inequality, can you share, you know, a, a pretty a pretty significant experience in your life that I think can be instructive for folks now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I came home, um, I th there was no real delay for me. Uh, forgive me, let me go back even. The night before I left Vietnam, um, there was a, you know, a other guys and women who were about to fly in the same flight as I did coming back home. And the guy that was in like this cubicle next to me had a uh, recorder, I guess it was eight track then, but it, he had some kind of recording of a band, Steppenwolf, great band. <laughs> and one of the favorite songs I mean, at the time I hated it because the son of a bitch kept playing it over and over and over again, I swear. But it was the song, it's called America Monster Suicide. Mm. One of the great songs that I have, I continue to post because it's so relevant even to today. It talks about how America was founded on this principle of freedom and justice and how we got lost in it. it. It's just excellent. But, so that was the night before I came home, which set a real tone. So when I got back to the States and feeling just so, um, I was in pain, Paul. I really was. I was in, I had so much survivor guilt. I was a combat medic. I spent 18 months in Vietnam. Um, and I swear to God, I wish I had had a flesh wound or not too serious, but if, so I could fixate. This is why I'm so pained. This is why I'm so angry. This is why I'm so outraged. And men, as you know, when we're hurt, we don't react in like, oh, my feelings are hurt. I'm depressed because I, killed someone. We get angry. We express our pain through anger. And that's what happened to me. I was angry at this country. I was angry at me for not doing more. I was angry at the Vietnamese. I was angry at Americans for their ignorance and their apathy, their indifference. Um, and it was all these feelings and I wasn't able to process them. There was no like some, you know, PTSD, they have some delay. It was no delay for me. <laughs> I mean, my shit was oozing out of my system. Mm. When I finally got home, there was a welcome home party for me. Um, some of my childhood friends, um, a lovely family, the Armenian family, the Pildarians, had a party for me. Mm. And all our neighborhood kids, many of them who had served in Vietnam, I, I played on a statewide CYO basketball team, the championship basketball team in 1967-68. We won a state championship. Four of the five of us starters, our asses ended up in Vietnam. One was an Irish dude, one was Italian, another brother and me. Mm -hmm. um, so coming back, I hit the States Three weeks after being out of the army, I was involved in an accidental shooting. And um, it was as insane as some of the combat experiences I was in in Vietnam. But in the States, it was very different. No ARCOMs, Army Accommodation Medal, no recognition. This was a tragic accident. And I was involved in shooting of a friend over drugs. And my friend Mark Olson, my good friend and I, we were buying drugs from another friend and um, again, a tragic shooting and, and a third friend, Kenny Donnelly, was killed. And 
I couldn't believe it. I, that, if anything, kind of tipped me over another edge because here I spent 18 months trying to save lives and although I was involved in killing in Vietnam, I, you know, I was war and shooting back at enemy and, but in the States that night, January 6, 72, um, I could not believe it. And I won't say it was related to Vietnam or anything, it, it happened. But more important than Kenny's, not more important than Kenny's death, more important than my incarceration, Kenny's mother, Gloria Donnelly, testified in my defense. She visited me, she was sitting with my mother actually at my arraignment and I, my brain wouldn't quite confirm that this is Kenny's mother. I, who is this woman sitting with my mom and sister for my arraignment? And it was Mrs. Donnelly. Mm. And my mom uh, sent a message to me in the holding cell that she wanted, Mrs. Donnelly wanted to speak with me. And I must tell you, there was that little fantasy. I thought, well, maybe she's going to sneak in a gun and shoot me. And, but that's okay. My life's over anyway. Fuck it. And so she came down, and to my great surprise, she said, Wayne, I forgive you. She asked me what happened, and I told her. And she said she forgave me. And she prayed with me. She said, an hour father. And, you know, my mind was like in, back in Saigon, <laughs> back in the boonies and everywhere in between. I could not make heads or tails of this, but Mrs. Donnelly, her compassion, her forgiveness was a lifeline. Um, I thought suicide, of course. I thought of ways I could die, wanted to just whatever. Um, but Mrs. Donnelly, Gloria, she had a love for me. It, hmm. it, it, it's stunning to say it. Um, she was, she happened to be white, um, as was Kenny, of course. Um, she testified in my defense, Paul. And in the Providence Journal Bulletin, there are numbers of articles written about my case, this episode, in part because it, one of the articles talked about how American veterans were getting involved in drugs over there and we were a potential threat. We were coming home and what was what were we bringing back from Vietnam with us? So, you know, I became a little bit of a stereotype where this article was a bit of a warning, mm. but all of that paled in comparison to Mrs. Donnelly's compassion, forgiveness, indeed love. I, I didn't deserve it. Um, but I found a way to accept her forgiveness. I testified as to what happened. I was convicted of manslaughter, sentenced to 10 years in jail. Um, Mrs. Donnelly visited me when I was in prison. Uh, I wrote to the judge, Judge Jean Gallant. And I'm not even sure what the hell mm. I fully said, other than I tried to explain to him how, um, like as, a, as having come back from having served in Vietnam, and I, I, I couldn't do justice to whatever the hell it was in this letter I sent him, but as it turned out, 
two years after I was released from prison, I was very active in um, dealing with refugees and veterans. And, and um, I met Judge Gallant. I was uh, invited to serve on the board of directors of this refugee group. And this elderly, distinguished, white-haired fellow came up to me and said, uh, Wayne Smith, I've been following your career with great interest. And I must have been, I felt smug. Oh, thank you, you know. <laughs> and who are you? And he says, um, Gallant, Gene Gallant. Well, thank you, Gene. Uh, what do you do? He said, that's uh, Judge Gene Gallant. I'm a superior court judge. <laughs> wow. And it all fell in. I, I don't do justice to how humbling that moment was. But Judge Gallant wanted to sincerely tell me he had been following my career. I'd been very active in, the, in prison. I was involved in prison reform. Uh, group. We formed a small organization called the National Prisoner Reform Association. It was one of the members, one of the board members. We lobbied to change some laws while I was in prison. I got into a college degree granting program. But back to Judge Gallant, he said, um, uh, can I take you out to lunch? I'd like to talk with you. And, and I did, and we went out several times. Um, and I, one of the things I'd written to him in a letter, I thought that the sentence of 10 years was too much. It was an accident, and, but having been responsible for the taking of a life, it was almost irrelevant. And um, perhaps the sixth or seventh time we went out, Judge Gallant told me that his name was gonna be put in nomination to become the Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. And he asked me what I thought of it, and I thought, good for him. But then he asked me, would I be willing to testify before the Rhode Island Senate? at his confirmation hearing. It was like, holy shit. <laughs> and, uh, how could I refuse? So I did. In fact, that's also been full circle, full yeah. documented as well. And although he didn't get the appointment, he was nominated. I testified. And, and I thought that he did administer justice in a fair way. And that's what I said at his confirmation hearing. But more importantly, Paul, I think, uh, I'm sorry for being so wordy on this, but the fact of having survived and the fact of being open to change, to seek redemption, if you will, to try to make amends, not I couldn't bring back the lives of the Vietnamese that I and we killed. I couldn't bring back Kenny, but I channeled my pain, my passion, my future in some ways and trying to make the world a bit better, a bit different. And that's what has really driven me for so many years. Um, I still have great anger over the shitty war that Vietnam was, the 60,000 dead Americans, the 2 million Vietnamese. Um, one doesn't walk back from things like that, but one can try to find some meaning. And that's what I've, in effect, been able to do. Mm -hmm. Not just with vets, and I'm not a super vet guy at all. In fact, you know, many veterans, um, too many veterans, I'm sorry to say, seems to me that they think that we are somehow special. We're not special in any other Americans. We simply did our duty, and it was my choice. I joined. And I don't need to be thanked for my service, but I do want and believe that 
other Americans can really learn a lot from us veterans. Because as you had asked earlier, I mean, we veterans know how to, we're driven by mission. We're driven by purpose. We have an ability to move from problem to problem solving pretty quickly through analysis. We are, I think, particularly good with team building and effective working toward effect. And perhaps more importantly, we as veterans have been in the most racially integrated system that this country has. Mm. Um, Can I that I see the commander of the Air Force just the other day is African American. But more than that, the recognition of women. Women have exceeded and succeeded in senior levels of, of leadership and ability. So some of the experiences that we've learned in the military, certainly in war, gives us an appreciation, not only as we talked about at the top of the program, to function in this chaotic, insane, pandemic, global war, racially divided country and world, but it allows us to still have a real passion for our democracy, mm. a genuine passion and love for a fellow man and woman, absolute respect for the ability that teamwork, working together, what that can produce for us, both in war and in peace. So I see veterans as like you have for so many years as the answer, the solution to so many of the problems we have mm -hmm. as a nation, as a people. You, you're the answer to a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of problems. You, you're, you're a force for change towards solutions. And first of all, thank you for sharing all that. That is, that is a load to, to, to process and to share and to understand. And I've never, you know, had you take me through the full extent of it. So I am extremely grateful for that. And I, you know, I don't know if Mrs. Donnelly would see a day when you would be a part of a team that was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, right? When you would go on national television, you've been to the White House, like this, this kid whose life could have gone so many different ways, right? And that act of forgiveness and, and these hands along the way that helped you or, 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 or worked with you in some way, but most of all, your tenacity to go through that low point and come out on the other side is something that I think really powers you. Like a, a lot of folks who know you don't know about that point in your history and they find out later and they say, oh, you spent time incarcerated. And it, it, maybe, it, maybe it shapes your, your contemplative, um, you know, ponderous wisdom that comes out of it, right? Like dealing with a pandemic, you know, it must be tough, but it can't be tougher than being in prison, or maybe it is, I don't know. But I think your, your, your viewpoint now is so valuable. So I don't wanna, I wanna, I wanna take it forward and ask you, Wayne, the question I ask of all of our guests, because I think it's so interesting to hear what you think. But Wayne Smith, what makes you angry? Oh, there is so much that gives me hope, but what really makes me angry is ignorance. Mm. Ignorance produces injustice. Ignorance, which is people basically don't know. So many Americans, African Americans in particular, um, don't have white people over to their homes. So many white people don't have African Americans, Hispanics, Muslims, Jews. So we, have somehow gotten lost by living in these silos, in these well-appointed 
neighborhoods that keep us more isolated than together. And it is the absence of fairness, the absence of justice that really makes me angry. But it all begins with basic ignorance, I think. Mm. And I say that because, you know, my analysis of the American people is we are basically a decent people. We believe in giving people a fair chance. We believe in if one works hard and on merit that they should get ahead. We believe that anything is possible. And we're one of the few people on this planet that wake up every day, mostly, certainly until the pandemic, but most Americans woke up every day thinking, tomorrow can be a better day. Mm. That's not the case with most yeah. of the world. Yeah, yeah. And so this real sense of fairness, and this isn't just Wayne Smith talking, so much of what I've said to you and you know of me has been through the good graces of so many other people who have been kind or generous or willing to, like you said about Ryder, walk with me, mm. to see me as a friend or as a, as a friendly sort of person. And, and we are others. So when you say all the nice things you're saying about me, and you know and I know that's bullshit, but you know it's, <laughs> it's not it's nice that you see that is it is not uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm uh, really you know I, I think I've said to you there are two Wayne Smiths on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Mm. There's uh my name's Wayne Franklin Smith. There's a Franklin Wayne Smith on the memorial. Wow. So I have no illusion <laughs> about if I had gotten whacked or lost a limb like so many others, um, no, I, I'm, I've been blessed, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're, and we're, with Kenny, we're, Kenny's death and my incarceration, um, that has helped to shape me to be the person I am. Mm -hmm. And I would not be, I'm confident I would not be as driven to want to see real integration. It's not about diversity. It's about integration. It's about integrating this country and this world so that people with disabilities and able-bodied people, people who are gay or whatever the differences, that we are one species, we have one planet. And the only way we're going to get through this, as this pandemic has showed us, and we're not through it yet, but is by being considerate of our neighbors and our families and our friends. So for me, I, I think what makes me angry, I know what makes me angry is the ignorance of not appreciating how truly blessed we are to live in a country that even though it was built on slavery and built on the annihilation of Indians, native people, we took their lands and robbed them of their natural resources. And we built the capitals, the White House, and other buildings on slave labor and enslaved people that looked like me for 250 years, and another 100 years of Jim Crow. And so the last 50 years have been civil rights. But even in this country, there are people who are willing to put their lives on the line so that future generations, your children and my children, and our children, mm. can have a better life, can achieve what Dr. King called the, the ability to be judged on the content of their character. So 
I see again, I'm just another little cog in this. And, you know, this could be the last interview I ever do. This could, you know, my time on this earth, you know, is I'm on borrowed time. Mm -hmm. You know, Agent Orange got me. It's had me for a while. Um, I don't know what my future holds, but what I do know is that we can, as a people, overcome enormous difficulties, some of which I've shared with you about myself. But again, Paul, I'm not any way significant. If I can do this, anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. The only difference is most people, they never get tested. Mm -hmm. They never get shot at or like mm -hmm. what Winston Churchill said, there's nothing so exhilarating as being fired at and missed. <laughs> when you, it's like, holy shit, that couple of inches. Yeah. Well, you are, you are exceptionally valuable to this country, to, to so many communities, to my family. I mean, at this moment in time, and, and I think many people feel like they're being fired at now in this environment, right? So I, I wanna give you a minute or two, if you can, the, 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 the protests happening in this country right now. The Black Lives Matter movement, um, the, the George Floyd um, funeral and, and the movements that have followed, um, you know, and, and the backdrop of Trump as president and now the increasing militarization of the response um, you've always been, you know, a warrior for peace and, and a nuanced critic um, and, and voice of reason around issues of military and, and military civil conflict. But, but I just got to give you a chance to, to break down, you know, the George Floyd killing, murder, and in and, and this last couple of weeks, what, what, you, what do you see? And what do you want people to know? Maybe like you are a teacher to me, you're a teacher to so many. What do you want us to remember? Because part of what you've always done is, is redefine patriotism. And I think it's being redefined now by the protesters and by the National Guard and so many others. But, but, but Wayne, break it down. What do, you, what, what do you want us to know? What, what should well, we? You know, I, I, again, I reject that I'm a teacher. I'm learning. We're figuring all this shit out, man. Okay. We're, we're in deep water. We've all never right. been here all before. Right. So that, given that fact. Given yeah. that fact. I must tell you, Paul, um, you, you know, George Floyd and like so many other men and women who have been murdered by police, that's in that category of injustices. And there have been so many cases of injustices that it can be overwhelming. Um, and if we focus on just the tragedy, it'd be like focusing on Vietnam. Like so many of my brother Vietnam veterans who only focus on Vietnam. It's like Vietnam is frozen in 1968. Mm. Like never moved. It's still, in, no, that's not it at all. That's the thing that makes me angry. Ignorance. They haven't informed themselves. They haven't learned. But what we have seen through what one might call the martyrdom of George Floyd and so many others is we have seen an awakening and these shifts happen in this world. I think it was Karl Marx who called them magic moments, but there are these moments in history where we can see quantum shifts mm. over something it seems almost rudimentary, yeah. like um, the shooting of Archbishop, I'm sorry, Archduke Ferdinand in 1914 plunged the world into World War I, the war to, the war to end all wars. Right. Do, didn't do anything except <laughs> he got more wars. Right. But this racial... We have a come to Jesus moment on race in this country, but it's again predicated on the fault lines that have been exposed by the pandemic, that millions of Americans have felt in many ways like second class citizens. Millions of Americans have seen day in and day out they're lied to by the president, by 
Republicans in the House, and just the level of cowardice, fear that has gripped our nation and its leaders, I think has inspired millions of Americans across the country. So while George Floyd is the figure, is the person who has been killed and we fixate on, it's the injustice that millions of Americans are reacting to. I heard Al Sharpton, not one of my favorite people at all, but I heard Al Sharpton the other day talk about, he was asked somewhat of a similar question. And this is probably the only time you'll ever hear me quote Al Sharpton, but <laughs> Al was asked, or he was talking about how he was at a, a memorial service or a march for George Floyd. And, you know, he's known for a big mouth. He's a rabble rouser. That's what he does. But he's also effective. But so he said he, he was um, at this rally for George Floyd and this little blonde haired blue eyed white girl came up to him and tugged on his jacket. And um, he said, I braced myself, you know, I knew like, you know, probably gonna insult me or something. And he looked down at her and she held up her little fist. She's about 11 years old, he said. She held up her little fist and she said, no justice, no peace. Hmm. And that to me, that's the picture. Hmm. You've seen these demonstrations largely led by women, diverse, integrated, hmm. the face of America. Hmm. So what we know as movement people is movements don't happen at the top. They happen at the ground level. Mm -hmm. It's where the people are. And so Trump is the most dangerous man, in my view, he's the most dangerous man to our democracy, perhaps in our history. And I remember over a year ago, two years ago, you and I were lamenting, where are the generals at? Where are the leaders? Why isn't General Kelly saying, look, this guy is a boob? Mm. General Matt is saying this is incompetent, that our democracy is at risk. Yeah. And it is. And they were asleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. They've seen these demonstrations. They've seen these little white, black, brown, and red children saying, hell no, no more. So this is a moment where America has a come to Jesus moment where we are faced with what kind of country are we going to be? Are we going to be the kind of country where we're going to have, let the president have his, ne his knee on our neck? Hmm. Are we going to have the Republican party keep us frightened and divided over race, over class, over gender? I think the American people, I'm enormously proud, Paul, to see the American people march. And marching isn't a solution, but marching is the beginning of a solution. Mm -hmm. So they are walking because they don't know what else to do. It's on people like us to help them channel their passion, their pain, mm -hmm. their righteous anger, yep. but to make it constructive. And anger, as you and I, I remember having this conversation with you before you rolled out your podcast series, that anger, psychodynamically, anger can be enormously great energy if channeled properly to something constructive, or it can be destructive as we saw that handful of thugs, you know, trying to undermine the good work of peaceful demonstrators and they failed too. Yep. So we are at a moment in our history that is critical because even when we change this traitor in the White House, and I believe we will, that's when the work really begins mm -hmm. because there's been such a degradation of our environment 
of the kinds of safeguards to our democracy were truth. I remember you when you started Operation Truth. Truth in war, truth is the first casualty. And this guy has killed it. We can bring it back, but he has killed it. Mm. Where if he were to say that the Russians have bombers in the air and they're heading toward us, I wouldn't believe him. Mm. Would you? It's, it's, it, no, I don't believe anything he says. But interestingly, bo Russian bombers were only a couple miles away from Alaska in the last 48 hours. Oh, yeah, they've so, been testing it. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, so, so the, the stakes have never been higher. Um, your voice has never been more important. The last question I want to ask you, and I hope you come back. I mean, this, this conversation is an introduction to Wayne Smith. I I'm hope. sorry for going on so long. No, I'm glad really. you did. I told you, this is why I did this podcast, why I did it in this format, so we could take the time to understand issues, to, to talk openly like we do when we're having a drink, like we do when we're having a smoke, like we do when we're having a walk because real political conversations don't happen in 10 minute bursts between you know, pharmaceutical commercials. They happen like this and, and they go in different places, but it's how we learn, it's how we grow, and it's how I've um, really, I think, been so shaped by, by your experience and, and your wisdom. But look, let me ask you the question that, that, I, that I ask of everyone that's also important. Wayne Smith, what makes you happy? Ah, that, that's a long list. <laughs> um, well, you can rattle through it. Um, I'm able to see the sunrise, Paul. And I told you about that moment in time when I was on Narragansett Beach with a hippie chick and <laughs> you're watching the sunrise. Well, I can watch the sunrise with my sweet wife now. And, yeah. and we do. So the sunrise, um, the company of good friends, the excitement of learning new information about climate change, about the discoveries that we are making daily through archaeology and other kinds of, of search for our roots and history. Um, I'm, I think I'm probably happiest in some ways kayaking with my wife. Mm. There's something very zen about picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalades. Not the tangerine trees or marmalade skies, I grant you, but there is something very zen about being on or near the water, being simply being. Again, at this stage of my life, and I remember hearing older people before, you know, and think, ah, this is the old guy. Now I'm the old guy. <laughs> and now, looking back again, um, I, I, I mean, just the times of watching you as, I remember you before you were a father. Mm -hmm. So seeing you with your sons and Lauren, your lovely wife, with your beautiful children, and I'm able to say, I knew you guys before you <laughs> had, before you had, and now you got two little beautiful. So those are the, it's the living, you see. Yeah. It's the quality of life. It's these things we take for granted or took for granted before the pandemic, just the ride over to have lunch with a friend. Um, so I, I, I don't mean to be evasive, but- No, those are all, those are all really good answers. And you break, yeah. you, you break, you know, you, you always help me bring it back to the core, whether it's the core of family or the core of America or the core of nature. Like that's, you know, I, I give you shit about it, but I say you are an elder. You are an elder in the veterans community. You're an elder in the social justice community. You're an elder for America. You're a keeper of the flame. You know, you are a guardian, you know, uh, of the fabric of the flag that sits behind me. I mean, you, well, you, 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 are, you are, and, and you've taught us, you've taught me and, and Jeremy and so many others, you know, in the movement and beyond, you know, more young and, and older veterans than you'll ever know, but people beyond that. I mean, now is the time when, 
you know, our country is tested and the true patriots have to step forward, but we also have to look back and make sure people recognize who you are, the work you've done, and we learn from it because it, it's so essential to this moment. And, and I am just infinitely grateful for you. I could talk to you for hours. We normally do. I hope this is an introduction to people on the life and wisdom of Wayne Smith. I hope they read and see everything you've ever done. We will post links and do all of that. But I do have to give you a presentation of the gifts. Can I, before you do, can I yes. just- Because your wife, you. your wife and my wife are gonna be like, where the hell are they? <laughs> what the hell are they been doing? I'm in the garage. You're in the Zen fucking, you know- pool. I'm in the wood room. Yeah. <laughs> but the one thing that, you know, it's funny, and I'm, I'm gonna put it back to you because, you know, when I think of me and see me when I do that, and I will tell you, there are times I see myself in the mirror, like, what the hell, how is it with this gray hair? What's with this, <laughs> really, what happened? But you still wear sneakers, you know, you still have, you're the youngest guy I know, you wear sneakers to the White House, you know, you know, you you have the coolest <laughs> vibe around. You have a magic with children. Uh, I mean, you are like if like my, my my you know one of Rider Save People in the World is Santa Claus. Like you're on a level with Santa Claus in my house. Like because uh, you have this Zen that is bigger than anything. So that is that is beautiful. So I got we let, speaking of Santa Claus, I gotta give you some gifts here. So let me give you some gifts if I can, okay? So these are virtual gifts. You know how this works, but I'm gonna send you some uh, Angry Americans gear. Sweet. Uh, and, and you can have that when you're out um, kayaking. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> send you some Bravo Sierra. You know about them. They are the sponsor of uh, this podcast and everything we do. Outstanding. They, they work very closely with the military, produce awesome stuff. So we got some antibacterial body wipes, some deodorant, some other stuff for when you come back from your kayaking or world saving. <laughs> And then uh, lastly, I, you know, I don't know if there's any, this moment in time, uh, the, who you are, I always try to find a, 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 an appropriate uh, American made whiskey. Um, and I've been giving this out to folks because it means so much in its story. And the great Jeffrey Wright introduced us to Uncle Nearest, which, ah, which I may have to give out. They're definitely not definitely so cool, but I love them. You know, um, Nearest Green was, was the, uh, the former slave who taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey. And this Amen. is better than Jack Daniels. It's so much better than Jack Daniels. Amen. And, you know, <laughs> it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's a story and it's wisdom and it's just damn good and it's cool and it gets you through the night. And that's what Wayne Smith does for me and for America. Well, um, I got to tell you, you're such a lovely brother. Well. I, you know, you have been such an inspiration for so many of us. And, you know, especially true for Vietnam veterans, because the one thing, as you had asked about my anger and fear earlier, was the fear that when the last Vietnam vet died, that there wouldn't be truth told, mm. that people would, you know, tell war stories and lie about how, you know, and march to Trump's tune. You have spoken truth to power. You continue to be gracious and encompassing in the work that you do, the loving vibe you give out to the world, your hopeful message, even through anger. You are a true asset to us all, Paul. And I am honored and flattered that you think of me, that you consider me a friend and brother. I am so deeply touched. Mm -hmm. and I love you, man. Thank you, man. I, I love you more than words, um, but not more than one final gift. So you're not getting away from this one. Uh, you, you know how this works. We've got three colors of peeps. We have yellow, blue, and pink. Which color would you choose, Wayne Smith, and why? Um, well, I would choose blue because blue is my favorite color. Kind of blue, you know, miles. But, oh, um... yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. And you know what else? I mean, we've been talking about it. I have, hold on a second, see if I have. Uh, oh yeah, I do. Since it's my, my garage, you know, I've never done this before, but I'm also, I'm gonna send you a J, a really fantastic Sweet. one that I have, because we, my, my mother says we talk about drinking too much on this show, and I don't think yes. we talk enough about smoking right. on this show, 
So um, I'm going to send you some of the finest cannabis that I can find. <laughs> I probably, I don't know how, I may have to drive it to you. I don't, we, we can talk about that later. But well, uh, we, we, we won't do that because that's I've never actually long. done that as a gift. And I think it's a wonderful gift. It used to be a much more uh, needed gift when you like came into a city and, you know, marijuana restrictions were so much higher. You had a guy who could hook you up when you got to a town. It yeah, was like, man. oh, thanks, man. It was such a gift because it took so much <laughs> effort and it took so much forethought to be able to give somebody a little a bit of herb when you got to somebody's city. I have friends in different cities over the last couple of decades who've helped me in that way. And, and they said, you know, Paul needs a little medicine when he gets to town. So <laughs> you have been medicine. You, you, you got a lot of hippie in you, man. <laughs> oh, man. Well, look, it's a 69 Camaro behind me. And like, I used to love, like, you know, before I even met you, I was, I was into 60s culture and I read the books and listened to the music. So, so, you know, one of the names for the Camaro has been suggested Agent Orange. Yeah. What do you think about that? I, I think mean, it's absolutely cool. It may, I think, have to, it may have to be, right? Yeah, no, it's got to be. Thinking. It's like, it's kind of mysterious and if people don't know what it means. It becomes educated. You can't just call it like Sunkissed or Judy or whatever the hell, right? Or Orange Sunshine. There you go. There you go. <laughs> But you, listen, you are a dear friend, and I'm so Thank happy you. to be able to share your wisdom with the country at this time. Father's Day is coming up soon, too, and I want to wish you a happy Father's Day. I want to thank your, your amazing Father's wife, Day. Debbie, and your incredible wife, Mara. You are all um, warriors for this country and, 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 and people who are pushing forward truth and justice. It's a family effort, and you represent so much of the best of what this, this community and this country is all about. And I love you, man. I hope I can see you in person soon and, and give you a great big hug. But thank you for joining me on the show and for all that you do and all that you are. You truly are the Oracle. No, I am just another brother. And I love you, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the great and powerful Wayne Smith, you have been introduced. Okay? You the are Oz. Now, you are now the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> you Hold have back been turned on, and you will hear more of him in the future. This has been Rykoff and Smith live from 1969 and 2020. I love you, brother. Love you, brother, too. <laughs>